that you have been able to be here for the last several weeks as Pastor Andrew has been talking about our theme for this coming year, which is renewal. And I'm sure, probably like me, you have been personally encouraged by it. I know I've heard a large number of people uh, comment about how timely it has been in their lives. Uh, If by chance you missed it, let me just encourage you to go to our website and and take the opportunity to watch those messages, or or maybe watch them again. That would be okay, too. There's no penalty for that. So, um, but hopefully you've been blessed by that as much as I have been, if not more. Um, One of the things that he talked about last week in uh, the idea of renewal and our personal renewal overflowing into the lives of others was the acronym he gave us, BLESS. And in case you missed it or uh, were thinking about lunch or something at that point, the B stands for begin to pray. Begin to pray. And he challenged us to look for some people in the various spheres of our life, whether it's our family or maybe co-workers, neighbors, people in the community, but begin to pray for four or five of those people and ask that the Lord will begin to build those relationships. So B, begin with prayer. L was listen. Listen, that we need to take time to uh, listen to them, find out what's going on in their life. Ask the Lord to give us the opportunity to hear some things that were going on that might be opportunities for us to serve later on down the acronym. And so to just be listeners first and foremost. And Then the E is eat together. And I don't know that that's a legalistic thing. You probably can have coffee together. That'd be okay. But the idea is that that God will create opportunities for those relationships to be deepened. And and that might be having coffee. That might be having them into your home, sharing a meal together. Lots of uh, possibilities with that. But the idea is that deepening of relationship. The first S in bless was uh, to begin to serve. Right? So now we've been praying, we've been listening, we've been deepening that relationship, and now coming alongside to be the hands and feet of Jesus, uh, living that out for them. So begin serving them some way. And then finally, the, the, the last S is share. Be ready to share the reason for the hope that is in you. Be ready to share the gospel of Christ as, as God opens those doors, as we're doing the other things. And hopefully you've been thinking about that. You've begun praying about that. I guarantee you, if we will be faithful in pursuing that, what we're going to find is there are more and more opportunities for generosity. And so with that in mind, my plan today was to talk about renewing joyful generosity. That's the outline you have in your hand. It is not the outline we're going to talk about. About, about 8.30 last night, as I was finishing up my sermon, the Holy Spirit said no. Now, I, those of you that are preachers also, nobody on Saturday night at 8.30 wants to hear no. Okay? And, and so I was very spiritual about it, and I spent the next several hours trying to convince him he meant yes. <laughs> and, and so I labored, and, and the truth is I... I couldn't really get through even the first paragraph or two as I was working without bursting into tears. You might think that's an exaggeration. It is not. And so about 12.30, I went home, and I thought, I don't have a sermon for tomorrow. I, I, I don't know what to do with that, Lord. Um, i sure you have a good plan, but I don't know what it is. And so I spent the next several hours crying out, Lord, just tell me what you want me to say. I'll say it. I don't care. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It doesn't have to be good. I don't care what you do with it. But, Lord, just give me something. 4 a.m. 4 a.m. He gave me five words, okay? The tale of three churches. Those are the five words. Now, as you can imagine, that wasn't a lot of detail. But for those of you that know the Holy Spirit, that's all that it took. Just in those five words, instantly, I was like, yes, okay, I got it. I'm there. I was at peace. So I 
jumped up and started working on a brand new sermon. So the good news is it's still the same passage. So we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, which was John's first question when I told him, is the topic changed? Because he's thinking, I need to change songs in the next 30 minutes. So it's the same topic, just a different road to get there. So if you'd like, you can open to 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. If you're using the Bible that's in the seat in front of you, it's page 967. 967. And as you're turning, let me just give you a little background on, on what's going on at this point in time. Okay? So at this point in time, there is a famine that is impacting the church in Jerusalem uh, violently. And we read about it in Acts 11, 27 through 30. It says, Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Verse 29. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Okay, so there's this famine, and because of this famine, and also most likely because of persecution that was happening, the church in Jerusalem is, is suffering. The brothers and sisters in Christ in Jerusalem are struggling under severe uh, poverty and, and conditions that were harsh. And Paul, as it said in Acts, decides he's going to approach the churches outside of Jerusalem, primarily Gentile churches, non-Jewish churches, and ask them if they would be willing to give in order to support their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And so he does that and approaches uh, multiple churches about that. And in Corinthians, we see that happen in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4, where it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints... As I directed the church of Galatia, you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, then they will accompany me. So that's the first place that it talks about it in the church in Corinth. And then when we get to 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, what we see, and I originally planned to read all of chapters 8 and 9. I don't know if you're glad or not, but because of time, we're not going to. But I'm going to encourage you this week sometime to read through those two chapters in their entirety, just from front to end. And if you want to be a, a zealous person every day, that would be awesome. Okay? But what we see is... In 2 Corinthians, there's been about a year that has happened between the, the original plan in 1 Corinthians and now in 2 Corinthians. And we don't know, is that really a year? Is it six months? Is it nine months? There's some length of time that's substantial that has passed. And now Paul is making plans for someone to come and get the money that they've agreed to give. And in that, he's sending in this letter, along with other things, a, a reminder they've agreed to do this an encouragement to make sure it's ready when the people come. And so as we come into that in, in chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians, what we're going to look at tonight, uh, today, that's only first mistake, that's pretty good, um, is three churches, the tale of three churches. And, and so there are three churches that we want to look at, and then we're going to, we'll look through these two chapters at some things that hopefully are applicable, okay? So the first church I want you to consider uh, briefly is the church at Jerusalem, okay? They're the church that is uh, all Im implied from the very beginning, uh, as far back as 1 Corinthians, the church at Jerusalem, and think for a minute about their situation. Now, the, the church in Jerusalem is primarily the mother church of all the other churches, Right? Christianity has started there. It's flowed from there out into the surrounding areas to these other churches. And in the beginning, the uh, church at Jerusalem was the blesser, right? The one pouring forth blessings. We see in Acts 4, 32 through 37, this description. 
Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Verse 34. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. And so, originally, we see the church started, and there's an abundance. They're the blessers. The blessings are flowing out of them to others. They're self-sufficient. Their, their membership is caring for each other. There's not a single person that has any need. Now, we're only less than 20 years from there at this point when we get to 2 Corinthians. And so, in that 20 years, there's been a drastic change. They've gone from being the blesser to being the ones in need. They've gone from being the ones that were pouring out to being the ones that needed someone to pour in. And, and you can imagine that was pretty challenging for them. Okay, So that's the first church, the church at Jerusalem. The second church is the church at Macedonia. And now I'm going to say it's one church. Technically, it's probably at least three the church of Thessalonica, the church of Berea, and the church of Philippi, all probably very familiar to you. But at this point, because it talks about them as a whole, we're going to just leave them that way and say the church of Macedonia, okay? And what we see of the church of Macedonia starts in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 with verse 1. You can look, follow along as I read verses 1 through 5. It says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, and as I can testify, even beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. In 2 Corinthians, the church in Macedonia is held up as the model. They're, they're put forth as the example. They're the ones that, you know, you read this, and, and I, I assume you're like me. I think, man, that, that's, that's what I want to be, right? I want to be at the point where in severe tests of afflictions, I have an abundance of joy. And even in extreme poverty, I'm overflowing with the wealth of generosity. I'm just begging to be generous so that God's glory can be made manifest and, and, and we can multiply the thanksgivings to God. I mean, isn't that just, you read that and it's just like, yeah, that, that's the way I want to be. And, and hopefully that's what you want for our church, right? You want our church to be that kind of church. We're abounding in joy, overflowing with generosity, giving ourselves first to God and then to every opportunity in order to show a God's grace, in order to multiply the thanksgivings to God. So the church at Macedonia, that's number two. Then we come to the third church, the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth. And of course, they're the main focus of this passage as it's a letter written to them. They're also the most financially affluent of these three churches. Corinth is a city that's a large uh, city on a large trade route. It was a big place. There's a lot more funds flowing in and out of the city as far as things that are going on. Corinth is the church that has an abundance. And what we see as we look at this is they want to do what's right. They want to glorify God through generosity. They even had agreed to be generous. However, a lot of things got in the way. They were just easily distracted, right? If you remember the book of 1 Corinthians, some of the things that were going on, just a summary list here, divisions in the church, sexual immorality in the church, lawsuits against each other, questions about marriage and divorce, issues of idolatry and, and food offered to idols. They struggled with right worship, whether that was in communion or chaotic worship services. You know, all these things are going on in the church, and, and, and it just appears amidst all these distractions 
the generosity has gotten lost. You know, they, they wanted to do it, and they committed to do it, and yet somehow in this timeline, it kind of had fallen by the way. So those are our three churches, the church at Jerusalem, the church in Macedonia, and the church at Corinth. And now for a minute, what I'd like to challenge you to do is stop and consider which of these churches would be a good description of how things are with generosity in your life. Okay, so think for a minute, of these three churches, what would be a good general description of your relationship to generosity right now? For example, the Jerusalem church, you know, they're financially struggling. And so maybe that's a good example of whatever's going on in your life. There's financial struggle. And maybe it's because of things that were beyond your control. Or maybe it's because of your own doing, whether by mistakes made or whether by sin committed. But whatever reason, you, you want to be generous, but what you really need is to receive generosity. So maybe you look at that and say, yeah, that, that's pretty much where I am right now. Or maybe it's the Church of Macedonia. Maybe you're at the opposite end of the spectrum, right? Although you're not rich, maybe even facing some of your own struggles, you're experiencing just the overflowing grace of God, and it's filled you with joy and enabled you to overflow with generosity. You're looking for every opportunity to give in a way that glorifies God. Maybe you look at that and say, yeah, that, that's a good description of where I am right now. Or maybe it's Corinth. Maybe Corinth is, is where you are. And it's kind of in the middle, right? They, they, they are blessed with more than they need and, and desiring to be generous, but distracted by so many things that generosity got lost. And, and maybe you go, yeah, that, that's really a good description. Now, honestly, honestly, I don't think probably any of us is only in one camp, right? The, the truth is it's probably a, a fluid thing. There are, there are easy ways for us to move from one category to the other. One might describe you generally, but if you're anything like me, you know, you can be having a wonderful time in the Lord and, and, and feeling generous, and then somebody says something or something happens, and your selfishness pops up, and you're like, I'm just going to take my toys and go home. Right? I mean, you know, just a minute ago you were generous, you were loving Jesus and saying how wonderful God is, and then, boom, your selfishness pops up and you're like, I'm out of here. You know, the, the truth is we all, at different times, different stages, whether it's of the day or of our life, move in and out of these areas, okay? But, but if you were to say right now, you had to pick one of those three, just, just honestly, between you and God, which of those three would be you? As you think about that, I want us to consider some things we should keep in mind depending on where you are in that list of three churches, okay? Now, before we talk about them specifically, each church by church, there are two things, there are two things that I think we all need to continue to keep in mind, okay? No matter if you're in Jerusalem, Corinth, Macedonia, two truths that we need to continue to camp on. The first is this, grace is our foundation. Grace is our foundation, and actually, if you want to fill in the old outline, the first one was grace and the, something along the lines of joyful uh, generosity uh, is founded on grace. That's off the top of my head. Maybe it's right. If, if, if you're one of those people that like it, you, you know, filling that stuff out, you can. But the underlying principle is the same. Grace is the foundation. In, in ver chapter 8, verse 9, it says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And we all need to keep that in mind, right? If we're struggling, the grace of Jesus gives us hope. And if we have abundance, the grace of Jesus keeps us thankful and generous. We need to camp on the, the, the grace of God. It's the, sound, the, the foundation of all that, that he's doing in our lives. And there's no hope for generosity in us unless it's flowing through us, right? It all starts with God, and it flows into us and hopefully out of us. So we all need to keep that in mind. And, of course, that begs the question, have you experienced that in your life? Have you experienced the time when you recognized your own spiritual poverty, that there was nothing good in you, that you were purely self-centered with no hope, 
And then, and then you saw the riches of Christ. And you came to understand his sacrifice and how his sacrifice poured out those riches onto you, taking your poverty. Have you had that experience? You have that grace in your life. If you don't, then let me, let me challenge you. Don't leave today without finding more, finding out more. After, after church, I'll be up here. I would love to talk with you about how you can experience what it's talking about here in verse 9. Having the grace of Jesus Christ completely transform your life. But we all need to keep that in mind. Everything else flows out of grace. The second thing that we need to keep in mind, no matter where we are, is multiplying thanksgiving to God is our goal. Multiplying thanksgiving to God is our goal. Let me read to you 2 Corinthians 9, 11 through 15. It says, You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Verse 15. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. We all need to keep this in mind. We need to keep the idea that our goal is multiplying thanksgiving to God in mind. If we're being generous, it's to produce thanksgiving to God. We want more than to just meet people's physical needs. We want it to overflow in their lives so that they're giving thanks to God and Creator. If we're receiving generosity, we want to respond with thanksgiving to God and then pursue being generous ourselves so that we're multiplying that thanksgiving to God. Whatever position we're in, we want to be able to, to do what the apostle does at the end of this chapter and always be saying, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. You want to fill out another thing on your outline? Here's another one for you. The highest aim, it's the last one, it's the bottom, so you got the first and the last. The rest you'll have to ask me later. The highest aim for all of us should be this single purpose, to multiply thanksgivings to God. Okay, so wherever you are, whether you're at Jerusalem, Corinth, Macedonia, two things to keep in mind. Grace is the foundation, and multiplying thanksgivings is the goal. Now, let's talk about it specifically, church by church, depending on where you are. Things to keep in mind, okay? The first is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Now, nobody wants to be in the Jerusalem category, right? Nobody wakes up and says, man, I want to be needy and broken and hurting and struggling. Oh, please, Lord, let that be today, right? We, nobody wants to be there. We don't want to be dependent on the generosity of others. We'd rather be well off like the Corinthians and spiritually mature like the Macedonians, right? We want that mix. We want well off and spiritually mature. But the truth is, whether or not you're in Jerusalem now, you probably are going to be at some point. And there are a few things that we need to keep in mind when we're at that place. The first is, we need to take our needs to God in faith and believe that he will supply all we need. We need to take our needs to God and in faith believe he'll supply all we need. In chapter 9, verse 8, it says, God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And if you remember, when we talked about, the when we read through the book of 1 Thessalonians, I talked about the fact that that word abound really means super abound. It's not really strong enough. It's like exploding out of us, like overflowing, like a geyser overflowing. And so, when it says here, God's able to make all grace abound to you. What a glorious promise that is. And, and we need to remember that. We need to take our needs to God and have faith that he can meet them. And not only that, but in verse 11, not only does it say he's able, but it says he will. He will supply the seed. He will multiply it. So that's the first thing. Second, we need to accept generosity as first and foremost 
God's gracious provision. Let me say it again. When we're in the place where we're the recipients of generosity, we need to accept generosity as first and foremost God's gracious provision. So we don't want to at the point of need, get caught up in the gift and stop gazing at the giver, right? We don't want to look at, at relief that comes and, and it be something that we're focused on instead of seeing it, that ultimately it's all from Jesus. All of that is flowing from his goodness into our life. And we want to keep that in mind so that when things happen, our love and thanksgiving for God continues to grow. Another thing, continue to seek to abound in every good work continue to seek to abound in every good work. That was the end of verse 8, right? It said, let me read it again, God's able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. One of the challenges that we face when we're at the point where we're in need of receiving generosity is that we sometimes misdiagnose uh, our situation and think, there's nothing really we have to give, right? Because we're needy now. We're broken. We're struggling. But, but the truth is that's not what Scripture says. The scripture says that God is able to give us grace so that we can continue to be generous even when we've got nothing. Now, what's that look like? Well, it depends on the situation. But it might be being generous with our time. It might be in serving others. You know, it might be that there's some other things, maybe physical problems that keep you from doing things, but the truth is you can always be generous with your prayers. And so when we're at the point of being in Jerusalem, we want to be diligent to continue to seek to abound in every good work, not just be focused on our, our condition and our need and our brokenness, but seeking to give generously whatever we have to give. Last thing we need to keep in mind is when we do receive some form of generosity, that we need to respond in love and prayer to the gift given. In verse uh, 13, in chapter 9, verses 13 and 14, it says, By their approval of this service, they will glorify God. Because of your submission, that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Now, what that's basically saying is the church in Jerusalem is going to get this gift, and when they get this gift, their response is going to be one of longing, of love, of affection towards the givers, and they're going to be prayerful towards them. Now, I don't know if you appreciate that, but when you stop and consider what we've talked about before, is at this point, there's kind of a strain between the Jewish church and the not Jewish church, right? There's a lot of things going on, what, it, what rules they need to keep, and, and there's all this concern back and forth. And so now suddenly here, and, and, and I wonder if this isn't even some of Paul's underlying motivation in seeking the gift, here we have the Gentiles pouring out generosity on the Jews, the Jewish believers, and Paul says, when you do that, their hearts are going to be turned towards you. And so we, we just have to remember, when we're in that place and generosity comes, that the right response is a response of love and longing, a response of prayer, a deepening of relationship, a closer intimacy and commitment to one another. Now, I want to share a few testimonies with you. And, and, and the first testimony is, is ours, it's my family's. And, and it's this, we have probably spent the majority of our life in Jerusalem, okay? And, and just in summary, because, you know, I still have a lot to go. So, um, you know, when we first left seminary and we went to our first church, we took that job, we were making $500 a month. Now, it was 1977, I mean, not 1997, and uh, it went a little further, not as far as 77, but a little further than now. But still, we were married. We had a daughter at that point, And $500 a month doesn't go far. And we tried a number of things. We thought maybe uh, Brenda would teach, and then we felt like I was calling her to stay home and take care of our children and thought I would get another job, and I was having to drive an hour both ways commuting and, and the job itself, and so then I wasn't doing any ministry. And eventually we just had to say, okay, Lord, what, 
we don't know what you're going to do, but we feel like this is where you led us, and you're going to do something. And I, I don't have time to tell you all the things he did. But it, it's not an exaggeration to say we would go to the mailbox and get envelopes of money from people we didn't know. We'd get money from people we did know, too. It wasn't you know, either or, but... You know, we, we would have people from the church come uh, to church on Sunday and say, hey, I was in the bank, and uh, somebody walked up to me and said, hey, you know that new associate pastor and his wife at your church? The Lord laid on my heart to give them $500. Would you give them this? They didn't know. And, and example after example after example of that, I don't have time to tell you, but God just continued to pour out his grace upon us. And, and we needed it. There, there, we had no option. But to rely on the generosity of God and his people. And then at that point, too, we had, I had about $8,000 in college loans that were drowning us, because if you only make $500 a month, you have to pay, you know, you can figure it out. That's not good. No financial advisor would give you that as a plan. And, and, and so in it, I just kept saying, Lord, we're drowning. And, and the Lord is so gracious. He said to me, well, why don't you ask me to take care of it? And you know that moment where you're like, yeah. I don't, I don't, why, why don't I ask you to take care of it? And so we began to pray, Lord, would you pay off this loan? Because we think we're where you want us, and we're doing what you want us to do, and we're trying to be faithful, and we can't handle this, and in four months it was paid off. Again, miraculously paid off. Okay. And so that's just the beginning. The truth is, you know, living in ministry like we have all these 22 years we, we live in Jerusalem. Everything we have is from the gracious hand of God's people. You know, I'm dependent. I'm dependent on the grace of God and the generosity of his people for everything. But God has continually, time and time again, done it. So first testimony. Let me share another testimony uh, of people in the church. Um, some of you may recognize this. But it says, we have been blessed several times by the generous giving of members of the body of Christ. Several years ago, we had a trip planned to visit family during the month of July, and the air conditioning in our van had gone out. But we were just going to tough it out and drive with all the windows down. But shortly before the trip, I opened the passenger door of the van on a Sunday morning to find an envelope on the seat with our name on it. In the envelope was several hundred dollars. We never knew who gave us the money, but it turned out to be just enough to get the air condition fixed before our trip. What a blessing. A second time, we were given money in a similar way, and later that week, our garage door needed major repairs. God provided for these expensive things through the generous giving of his people. We are thankful for God's blessing of increased income so that we're now able to give back in similar ways. And we talk at home of, about, as a family about laughing when we give in secret, because God loves a cheerful giver. You know, God is so gracious. No one wants to be in Jerusalem. But in Jerusalem, you see God do so many things. And so just, just keep in mind that when you're there, to take your needs to him so that when you see his faithfulness, the thanksgivings of God are multiplied. Okay, so that was Jerusalem. Macedonia. When you're in Macedonia, what are some things to keep in mind? And again, this is a place we all want to be, right? Spiritually mature, overflowing with generosity. You know, we're, we're, when we're facing challenges, we're still seeing God's grace super abound in our life. I mean, that's what we want. But even there, we have to keep some things in mind. We have to keep some things in mind. First is, we need to seek to sow bountifully. We need to seek to sow bountifully. In chapter 9, verse 6, it says, the point is this. I always like it when the Bible's clear and says the point is this. That's just very useful. It says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And when we're in Macedonia, one of the things we have to keep in mind is we need to continue to seek to sow bountifully. And not only that, but what I believe you'll see happen is as you're sowing, God will continue to pour out more grace upon you. Now, don't misunderstand me. This isn't the health and wealth gospel. I gotta tell you, you sow $100, you're gonna get $1,000. Although that has happened to me. But the goal is not financial well-being, right? That may be an end result, 
but ultimately it's because he's given it to you to use for the glory of God, for his kingdom. Matter of fact, as a aside, it doesn't really fit in here, but I just want to say it, so I'm going to just throw it out there. Even this week, as I was praying and preparing for this message, I go to the mailbox and I pull out a piece of mail. Guess what it is? You're never going to guess. I'm going to tell you. It was a letter from Chick-fil-A. I worked at Chick-fil-A a total of two weeks. Two years ago. So for two years, this money had not come to me. I don't really care because I wasn't working there to make money. That's another story we can talk about. But I, the week I'm talking about God's generosity, I go to the mailbox, I take out an envelope, and it's got money from my two weeks of working two years ago at Chick-fil-A. Now, that could be a coincidence if you believe in coincidences, right? But when that happens, I look at it, and the first thing I say is, Lord, what's this money for? I don't suppose that it's for me. I suppose you're giving it to me for something else. What's it for? So when we're in Macedonia, we need to seek to sow bountifully, reinvest the dividends, so to speak, as you're seeing God's grace poured out in your life. Second, second, make sure your generosity is intentional, voluntary, and an expression of your delight in God's goodness. In case you're curious, that actually is the three remaining points on your bulletin, intentional, voluntary expression. Um, and, and the point is this, uh, just as we read earlier in chapter 9, verse 7, it says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so when we're in Macedonia, we need to keep that in mind. We need to remember that we want to pursue the right kind of generosity. We want to pursue being intentional, being voluntary, you know, not under compulsion. It be an expression of our delight. We don't want to be sourpuss givers, okay? We need to keep that in mind. And, and let me just bring up a delicate subject here, or maybe we'll get me fired. But let's talk about the dangers of tithing. The dangers of tithing. Now, you probably have never heard a sermon on the dangers of tithing before, have you? But, but I'm concerned about this because in tithing, it's so easy that our generosity becomes unintentional. Right? Tithing can take the intentionality out of our generosity. And what I mean by that is we just begin to think, I'm called to tithe, that means 10%. If you don't know, tithe means 10%. And, and I'm called to give 10%, and so that's what I'm going to do. And you set it up on your bank account, and it just does it automatically, um, and then it's just over. You don't think about it anymore. Right? But, but that's not what we're called to. You see, we're called to radical joy-filled generosity that, that is intentional. It needs to be a dialogue that's going on in our life. It's something that should be happening between us and Jesus. It should be a matter of conversation all the time. Don't, don't let the tithe become an autopilot. Okay. Second, second danger. I think tithing can also, can, doesn't have to, I'm not saying these things have to happen, to say they can happen. Tithing can, in a way, become a compulsion, right? We can get to the point where we feel like we have to tithe because that's what Christians do. You know, back in the day, you know, you even got your envelope and you had to check off all the legalistic things you did, read the Bible, did this, tithe, that. You know, we, we can let it become a tradition that, that we feel pressure, we have to do it. And, and in God's word, it says right here to us that our generosity needs to be both intentional and voluntary. And so even in our tithing, I would encourage you, don't feel like it's a, a duty. Not that there's anything wrong with just doing what you're supposed to do. It is a place to start. We'll talk about that. But, but in it, it's supposed to be a relational thing. You know, if, if I come home and bring my wife flowers and she says, thanks, which never happens. Sorry, sweetheart. But, <laughs> but if she's, she says thanks and I say, it's okay, it's my duty. You know, the one time I bought flowers that year, it's out the door, right? It's over. It's over. So it's the same concept. The, the dangers, those two dangers with tithing, with it becoming just something that's done without thought, 
and it's something that's done under compulsion. So be careful. I'm not trying to convince you to stop tithing. Remember, I already said I'm dependent on the giving of God's people, so that's true. But, but we want to be scriptural. We want our generosity to be a reflection of God's heart. And God doesn't give unintentionally. And God doesn't give under compulsion. God is a cheerful giver, and he does it on purpose with great delight. And so that's what we're called to as well. So keep that in mind. Testimony, testimony. There's actually two testimonies from this area. Um, The first one says, Blessing from giving comes out of Matthew 25, verses 35 through 40, because... It says, what you do for the least of these, you do for Christ, ultimately. We are blessed by keeping that as a mindset. This can happen by taking a bag of groceries to someone in need, visiting someone in the hospital that didn't expect it, or helping make a rent or house payment. When God uses us to do these things, it makes us want to do it more. It's very rewarding being obedient and being a willing channel of blessing. We see God's word is really true, where he says in Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When we give out of love, our giving counts for eternity. As we give, we experience deeper love and connection with these people. A life of generosity reflects God's nature in a special way. We have found that giving grows a love in our hearts, and that love is actually more important than the gift in our hand. It gives meaning to our actions and strengthens our relationships, which brings us greater blessing. Being a cheerful giver brings pleasure to God and brings unity to the body. We can never outgive God. Amen. Let me say that again so you can say amen. We can never outgive God. I'm going to say it one more time. Say it like you mean it. We can never outgive God. Okay, that's better. Thank you. We pray. We have open hands and open hearts because all we have is from God's gracious hand. Another testimony. Our family has been blessed on the giving and receiving end of our church family's generosity many times. I've long been a firm believer in God's verse in Malachi 4.10, which states, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. God's economy is a beautiful one. The more we stay open channels to let his provision flow through, the more he seems to provide. In the giving, we get to enjoy being a vibrant and healthy part of God's family, whether through the general tithe or special funds such as youth trips, food drives, etc., We enjoy this opportunity to demonstrate our love for the Lord. It feels amazing to be a part of God's family and share in caring for their needs. We are all owners, shareholders in this family, and when we work to meet each other's needs, I believe we are living out the church as God intended. Amen. So, things to keep in mind with Jerusalem, things to keep in mind with Macedonia, and in third, Corinth. Things to keep in mind when we're in Corinth. Often in life, this is where we end up, right? If we're not, if we're not uh, being intentional or if we stop swimming upstream, so to speak, so often it's easy for us to settle in Corinth, right? We're thankful for grace. We want to be generous, but we're distracted by so many things. It might be the busyness of life or, or the accumulation of things. Maybe there are problems in our family or, or maybe it's spiritual laziness. We, we might be afraid we won't have enough or... Maybe we're afraid we won't have as much as someone else. Whatever the reason, when we get to this point, we've taken our eyes off the giver of all things. we fixed our eyes on the things of this world. And so when we're at this point, some things that we need to keep in mind. First, nurture your love and thanksgiving for Jesus. When you're in Corinth, you need to remember to nurture your love and thanksgiving for Jesus. You see, generosity is a natural byproduct of love for Christ. If if we're experiencing the love for Christ, if we're intimately loving him, generosity is going to flow out of us. In in 2 Corinthians 8.8, it says, uh, dot, 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 prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. And in chapter 8, verse 24, it says, so give proof before the churches of your love. Love is the underlying motivator. 
right? It's experiencing the grace of God and that forming in us a love that's deep and real. And so when we're in Corinth, we need to focus or, or give extra attention to nurturing our love and our thanksgiving for Christ. Second, make generosity a priority. Make generosity a priority. Now, I, I think about this. I think it's easy for us to think generosity is not important as some of the big things, right? Like faith. Faith is big. Or, or reading our Bible. That's, that's big. You know, prayer. Prayer is big. Generosity, no, it's so, so, so. But listen, it says in 2 Corinthians 8, 7, but as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. We need to make generosity a priority. It needs to be something that's intentional. We're thinking about it. We're dwelling on it. We're praying about it. We're pursuing God about it. You know, we're, we're looking for ways to, to build it into our life. And, well, I'm going to jump again. Next point. And then I'll say what I was going to say. Next point, start where you are. Okay? If you're in Corinth and, and you're struggling with being generous, let me encourage you, start where you are. Okay? And if that means the idea of 10% is too daunting, start smaller. But don't stop there. Okay? The important thing is to begin pursuing joyful generosity and nurture it in your life so that it will grow. Chapter 8, verse 12 and 12 through 15 says this, For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it's written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Start where you are. And, and let me just ch challenge you in this. You know, wherever you are, it could be Macedonia, it could be Corinth, but in this issue, let me challenge you to pray intentionally that God will enable you to do more. You know, look for opportunities that, that you want to be generous about, but you think, I can't really do that. I'd like to, to give whatever it is, $100 to Missionary Christmas, but I don't really have $100. December's a rough month. And pray intentionally. Say, Lord, I really would like to be generous to your people. I'd like to support those people who are taking your glory to the other parts of the earth, and, and I want to do this, but I don't have a means. Will you create the way for me to give? And then look expectantly. God will do it. You'll get a check from Chick-fil-A from two years ago. You never know what's going to happen, right? So just, just pray intentionally. Start where you are, but don't stop there, okay? Next, pray for God to provide the resources to enable you to grow your generosity. I think I just said that. Well, let me read you the verses that go with it. In chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, it says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Let's just get You guys really need to read these two chapters. Really, do it. I know you said you're going to do it. Some of you didn't, but you should have. You really need to read it. It's so rich. I mean, think about this. It says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing. Now think about this. That's a double blessing, okay? It says he's going to provide the seed and then the bread. Well, what has to happen to the seed before you get bread? Right? You got to sow it. I agree, absolutely. You got to sow it, and then you got to have a harvest. He's already promising. He's already promising. Not only is he going to give you a seed, but he's going to bless your efforts and there will be an abundance so it will increase the harvest of your righteousness. This isn't the righteousness that we get from Christ. This is the righteousness that we exhibit because of the righteousness we get for Christ. And as we're being generous, it's growing that in our life. So, okay, one final testimony. We're only slightly over. One final testimony. It's the testimony at the end of the story. In Romans 15, 25 through 27. It says, At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia 
and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them, for the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings. They ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. And, and this is the testimony, okay? When it talks about Achaia, it's talking about the church at Corinth. And, and so the end of the story is that the letter that he wrote to them was effective. They heard what Paul was saying, the challenge to be generous, to be joyfully generous, and they did. Achaia was pleased to make some contribution. And so the reason that that's good news is because it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are. You're going to pass through these different areas. But ultimately, as you cry out to God, as you pursue him, he's going to be faithful to walk you through it. He's going to be faithful to see you continue to grow and see you begin to multiply thanksgivings of God in your life and the life of others. Let's pray.